Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our presentation titled Workflows for Glycosylation in Sialic Acid Analysis of Biotherapeutic Glycoproteins. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. John Yan, Applications Chemist for the Bioconsumables Portfolio within the Chemistries and Supplies Division of Agilent Cross Lab. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the tab at the top of your screen. If any questions arise during the presentation, we encourage you to submit them in the Q&A box. Our speaker will address your questions following this presentation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Yan. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Good morning, and thanks for joining us today for this LabRoots virtual event. My name is John Yan, and I am an applications chemist here at Agilent. Today, I will be discussing workflows for glycosylation and sialic acid analysis of biotherapeutic glycoproteins. Here is an outline of what we will be covering today. We will talk about the importance of end-length glycans in terms of biotherapeutic function, as well as, as structural analysis during the development process. We will also discuss fluorescent dye options that can be used for end glycan analysis. Specifically, we will cover the benefits of dyes that we offer, such as instant PC, with its high fluorescence and MS response properties. We will also discuss an improved workflow that has been developed for the well-established glycan dye 2AB. We will also talk about helic-based separation options that Agilent can offer that utilize both fluorescence and MS detection options. And finally, we will discuss salic acid quantitation and analysis workflows. We will go through a plate-based total salic acid quantitation workflow as well as how to profile different sialic acid species via an LC workflow with fluorescence and MS detection options. Approximately one fifth of all proteins currently in the Swiss Prot database are known to be glycosylated. Glycosylation can impact protein folding, stability, and function. Glycosylation imparts diversity based on differences in glycosylation site, glycan composition, glycan length and structure. As it relates to biotherapeutics, more than 60% of currently marketed biotherapeutics are glycosylated. Glycosylation can be a critical quality attribute, and even when it is not, it is often still monitored as a product quality attribute. Monoclonal antibodies and antibody-derived therapeutics are glycosylated, as are other molecules such as blood factors like EPO. And more than 100 biotherapeutics have been approved in the US and Europe in the last decade, making characterization of these molecules very important. Here is a summary of the top selling pharmaceuticals in 2019. This list, is, this list is dominated by biologics, with eight of the top 10 molecules being biotherapeutics. And all eight of these biologics are also glycosylated. So we can see that there is definitely a trend towards biologics and that glycosylation is a post-translational modification, or PTM, that is very common, making glycosylation something that needs to be analyzed and characterized during the development process. Now that, now that we know that many biologics are glycosylated, let's take a look at the structure, structures of common and glycans found on biotherapeutics. Glycans are made up of multiple monosaccharide units, such as fucose, mannose, galactose, and acetylglucosamine, also known as GlucNac, and sialic acids. The common glycans found on monoclonal antibodies can be classified as complex biontinary glycans because of the presence of the two GlucNac residues attached to the glycan core, shown here on the left-hand side. This glycan is commonly referred to as G0F or FA2. The presence of core fucose, shown here as the red triangle, has also been associated with reduced ADCC activity when present on glycans of biotherapeutics, making it, a desirable, making it desirable to develop molecules with less fucose. The structure to the, right of the, to the right is G2F, which is G0F with two galactose residues. Galactose has been associated with increased CDC activity. Additionally, the presence of terminal salic acid linked to the galactose can lower the rate of clearance. This is, that is, the presence of sialic acid can increase the amount of time that the therapeutic stays within the body. On the right-hand side of this, of this slide is the structure of G2-FS2, 
they bind to antinary and glycan with two salic acid residues. Something else that is worth pointing out is that the linkage of the, of the, of the silic acid. Molecules produced in Cho cells predominantly generate glycans where the silic acid is linked in the alpha-2,3 form, shown here on the bottom, while above that is an example of alpha-2,6 linked silylation, which is seen in human cells. Later on, we will, we will talk about these differences in, in a little bit more detail. Another category of N glycans that is closely monitored during the development process are high mass glycans. Shown here are high mass glycans MAN5, 6, and 7, but these high mass glycans can go up to 8 and 9 as well. These types of glycans are immature glycans that are often produced under um, strenuous conditions and suboptimal uh, cell culturing processes when the, when the cells are being pressured to produce at higher tidal levels. High minus glycans can increase the rate of clearance, so it is something that is monitored during the development process. On this slide, we have examples of non-human type glycans. Oftentimes, biotherapeutics are expressed in non-human expression systems, so non-human glycans should be monitored due to possible immunogenic effects. Humans don't have the ability to make that gal alpha gal antigen shown here, which could be possibly be immunogenic. And finally, the presence of non-human salic acid, um, so often called Enigma or NU5GC, is also monitored due to potential immunogenic effects. We will discuss this in a bit more detail later, towards the end of the presentation, when we discuss how to monitor different types of salic acids. Now that we have some background of what, type, of what glycans are and why they are important, how do we go about analyzing glycans? There are many different options. Glycosylation can be looked at at the intact protein level. Here, LC, in combination with high-resolution accurate mass spectrometry, can be used on the intact protein or sometimes on the subunits to give information on the types of glycans that are present. Next down, we have glycopeptides. Here, glycoproteins are digested with a protease into peptides that can again be separated by LC and analyzed by a tandem MS. This, along with database searching, is useful for gaining site-specific glycosylation information. Next, we have released N glycans. Here, glycans are enzymatically released with an enzyme such as P and JSF, and the released glycans can be, can be labeled with a fluorescent dye to enable det detection in combination with LC or sometimes CE separation. Glycans can be analyzed with, without labeling, but this is much less common than labeling the glycans. And finally, glycans can also be monitored at the monosaccharide level. Here, glycans are acid hydrolyzed into their individual monosaccharides. Afterwards, the monosaccharides can be analyzed directly or after labeling with a, with a fluorescent tag. For this presentation, we are going to focus mainly on released and derivatized N glycans. Uh, here, the output is generally relative percent areas of the different glycan species. We'll also cover total sialic acid quantitation workflow towards the end of this presentation as well. Here's an overview of the offerings that Agilent offers for released N glycan workflows. There are automatable workflows for the Asimap Bravo liquid handler, utilizing the glycoprep sample prep workflow with, with dyes, instant PC, instant AB, 2AB, and APTS. We offer a rapid sample prep option with our GlyX workflows with instant PC, 2AB, and 2AB. We also have LC separation tools with our 1260 BioNER LC and 1290 UHP LC systems, as well as advanced bioglycan mapping hillate columns. And of course, we have mass spectrometers as well as other detection tools for the detection of released N glycans. And we have software tools like BioConfirm for the backend data analysis part of the workflow. Now I want to talk about N glycan sample preparation and how it has evolved over the years. Traditionally, N-glycan sample prep has been a very time-consuming process that could take one to two days with overnight deglycosylation and overnight labeling steps that are time-consuming and labor-intensive. In 2012, Prozyme introduced glycoprep, an all-in-one solution workflow that reduced the sample preparation time down to four to five hours with traditional reductive amination dyes such as uh, 2AB and APTS. After that, glycoprep with instant AB, a rapid glycosamine 
glycosylamine reactive dye was launched, this reduced the prep time to three to four hours. And most recently, Prozyme launched GlyX, the GlyX platform that brought the prep time down to two hours for reductive amination dyes and less than an hour for instant dyes. These two are these two top these two workflows at the top is what we'll be focused on, on today. Here's the schematic of the GlyX and Glycan sample prep platform showing how it works. The input glycoprotein is first denatured with a proprietary reagent for three minutes at 90 degrees Celsius. This open up, opens up the protein for deglycosylation by P and GSF, which takes place over the course of five minutes at 50 degrees Celsius. After this, the glycans are then labeled with your choice of fluorophore. For instant dyes such as instant PC, instant Q, and instant AB, the dye labeling is rapid and is complete in one minute. For traditional reductive amination dyes like 2AB and APTS, the labeling process takes 60 minutes. I should point out that there is no dry down step prior to labeling, which is often the case with traditional reductive amination dyes. After labeling, the glycans are cleaned up to remove excess dye. This process takes about 15 minutes. And now the labeled glycans are ready for separation and analysis. This slide shows the efficiency of the glyx deglycosylation method for a few different biotherapeutics. Looking at the deglycosylation by bioanalyzer, <clears throat> we see greater than 99% deglycosylation efficiency for targets that we have looked at, including rituximab, cetuximab, embryol, and zaltrap. The example shown here is cetuximab, where the n glycan sites on both the FC and FAB region, both on the heavy chain. Separating the P and GSF versus no P and GSF control out by bioanalyzer, the intact heavy chain in blue is shifted to a deglycosylated peak in red. This shows that the glyx deglycosylation workflow is efficient at releasing the N glycans linked on these molecules. Next, let's talk about the different labels uh, choices available for released N glycan analysis. On the top half of the slide, we have glycosylamine reactive instant dyes, such as instant PC with its high fluorescence um, and MS response. We have instant Q, which is a negatively charged dye for our glycuce system, and instant AB, which is which was the first generation instant dye developed for LC separation with fluorescence detection. We also have other workflows that utilize reductive amination dyes such as 2AB and APTS. We do not offer a workflow uh, for 2AA, but we do have many pre-labeled 2AA standards available for purchase. This is the structure of instant PC shown here. There's a tertiary amine that helps the label glycan ionize efficiently, efficiently and gives it the high MS response. The procaine core of the dye gives it the strong fluorescent signal, and there is an NHS carbamate that is the glycosamine reactive portion that gives it the instant or rapid labeling property. Workflow of time for the glyx sample preparation with this dye is around 45 minutes for 16 samples, and an, and an entire 96 well plate can be completed in about an hour and a half. On this slide, we have a comparison of different labeling dyes, including instant PC and 2AB. This is from work Prozyme previously released, presented at an ASMS uh, poster presentation. We can see the benefits of instant PC in terms of both fluorescence and MS response compared to 2AB. Now that we understand how to get to a labeled glycan, what is the next step in the analysis process? One of the most widely used methods for separation analysis of fluorescent labeled glycans is liquid chromatography. And the chemistry of choice is typically hydrophilic interaction liquid chromatography or HILIC. Separated glycans can, are, are detected with fluorescence and relative percentages of the different glycan species can be determined. MS detection is, is analysis, and analysis is also an option to aid in identification of different glycan species. Shown here is an example of a 60-minute HILIC method going from high organic to high aqueous over the course of the gradient to elute the labeled glycans. This is just an example, and methods can be customized to the user's need. Agent also offers different columns that can be used for analysis, including a 1.8 micron column suitable for UHPLC type separations, 
as well as a 2.7 micron column that is compar compatible with lower pressure HPLC systems. Here is an example of what instant PC label glycans from rituximab can look like. We see mainly biantery neutral glycans such as G0F, G1F, and G2F. Low levels of silylation. Um, these are the glycans G2FS1 and G2FS2. And we see a small amount of MAN5, all of which are consistent with the type of glycans normally seen on a monoclonal antibody. Here is an example of instant PC labeled glycans, this time from the FC fusion protein Embrol or Intercept. We see the same biantery neutrals as we saw before with rituximab, G0F, G1F, and G2F, but this sample also contains more, more examples of silylated glycans on the receptor portion of the molecule. These are G2S1, G2, G2FS1, G2S2, and G2FS2. Here is an example of what the MS total ion chromatogram looks like for embryo and glycans labeled with instant PC. We can see the MS response on the bottom can almost be overlaid on top of the fluorescence above, above it. This high MS response property of instant PC can aid in identifying low abundant glycan species by mass spec. Here is, is what the uh, mass spectrum of instant PC labeled MAN5 from this sample looks like. We typically see the M plus 2H form as a major addict of biantery glycans. For larger glycans, it is also possible to see M plus 3 uh, protons as well. When MS may not be an option for aiding in identification, we also offer a wide selection of glycan standards to label with instant PC. We offer quant qualitative standards of instant PC labeled glycans shown here to help support those that are trying to transition to this dye from older traditional dyes. Our selection includes individual glycans such as uh, common biantery and glycans commonly seen on IgG molecules produced in CHOF cells. We also offer different libraries of instant PC labeled glycans such as human IgG as well as out both alpha-2,6 and alpha-2,3 silylated glycan libraries. Please check out our website for full details of the different glycan standards that Agile offers. An added benefit to the use of standards is being able to, to distinguish between alpha-2,3 and alpha-2,6 linked silic acids. It has been reported in the literature that the that A2F or G2FS2, which can have um, salic acids linked in either the alpha-2,3 or alpha-2,6 form, have different retention times based on the two different types of linkage types. Here's an example of instant PC label standards analyzed under the same conditions shown that shows the alpha-2,3 form on the bottom having a shorter retention time than the alpha-2,6 form on top. This can be quite helpful as even MS analysis on its own will not be able to help determine the differences in the silic acid linkage. On this slide, we have a comparison of our instant PC labeled tri and tenray silo libraries, the alpha 2.6 version on top and the alpha 2.3 version on bottom, both analyzed under the same conditions. We see G3, the tri and tenray structure without silic acid has, has the same retention time in both samples, but with the addition of silic acid, up to three residues attached to the terminal galactose, we see that the retention time is shorter for the alpha-2,3 versus the alpha-2,6 form. On this slide, like the previous example, we have a comparison of our IPC or instant PC silylated tetraenterian library. Similar to before, the G4 structure without silic acids have the same retention time, but as silic acids are added up to four, on the four terminal galactose residues, the alpha-2,6 forms have longer, have longer relative retention retentions compared to the alpha-2,3 forms. Here is a summary of additional uh, application notes and technical notes that are available on our website or upon request that describe the use of instant PC. Feel free to download these resources and reach out to us if there are any questions we can help answer. Now I wanna shift and talk about our glyx with uh, 2AB workflow. 2AB is a traditional dye 
but now available with the added benefit of the GLI-X workflow. This can be a good option for those that want the benefit of a rapid workflow, but want to be able to, to relate new data to historical data. Since 2AB has been a well-established glycan label in, in many laboratories over the years. Like the Glyx with Instant PC workflow, we have the same in-solution denaturation and deglycosylation steps for this 2AB workflow. The difference we have here is that the reductive amination labeling step is completed on the matrix of the 96 wall cleanup plate. This takes 60 minutes at 60 to 65 degrees Celsius. This requires no dry down, which is an added benefit compared to traditional methods. After labeling, the glycans are again cleaned up to remove excess dye and are then ready for analysis. Total preparation time is around two hours versus older methods that can be much longer. Here is an example of what 2AB labeled end glycans from a Tuxman looks like. Similar to what we saw previously with Instant PC, we see mostly binary neutral glycans, G0F, G1F, and G2F, and we see good uh, percent CV values for the major glycan species. Here is a direct comparison of the glycan profiles for 2AB on top and instant PC on bottom, both for rituximab. We see the, ma the same major glycan species, G0F, G1F, and G2F, but the relative retention is shifted. Under the same analytical conditions, since 2AB labeled glycans are earlier compared to instant PC labeled glycans. And here is a side by side comparison of embryo or antenacept and glycans. We see similar results for the two dyes, as well as some added benefits in terms of resolution for instant PC under these condi LC conditions. We see uh, pairs of glycans such as G1. FS1 and G2F can have better resolution when labeled with instant PC compared to 2AB under these specific conditions. And here's an example of the total ion chromatogram for 2AB labeled in glycans from Embryo. We can see that the total ion chromatogram, or TIC, for 2AB labeled glycans doesn't compare to what we can see with instant PC. This is, the one out of, this is one of the added benefits of instant PC. The MS signal makes it much easier to ID glycans by mass with confidence. Here is a list of 2AB label standards that we offer. We have many of the common glycans seen on biotherapeutics as individual standards, as well as 2AB libraries such as human IgG and glycans, and several different salate libraries, both alpha-23 and alpha-26 linked uh, salic acids. On this slide is an example of our 2AB a silated triantery and glycan library analyzed by LC with FLD detection. On top, we have the alpha 26 library, and on the bottom, we have the alpha 23 version. Similar to what we saw with instant PC, the alpha 23 linked salic acids have a shorter retention time when compared to the alpha 26 form. We see G3 with no salic acids have the same retention time, but when the salic acids are added, to the terminal galactose, the alpha-2,6 form has a, has a longer retention time. Before moving on and discussing our salic acid analysis tools, I want to talk briefly about enzymes, or more specifically, exoglycosidases that can be used as an additional method to confirm structures of, of n glycans. We put together this app note in early 2019 using enzymes salidase, galactosidase, and hexosaminidase to digest specific monosaccharides off the intact glycoproteins prior to release and labeling with instant PC. Here is an example of how these enzymes can be used to determine the structure of glycans from embryo. Starting at the top is the control without, with no exoglycosidase treatment. Below that is a profile of sialidase treatment. We can see that the sialidated glycans have been knocked down, and we see an increase in the glycosylated peaks. Below that is the combination treatment of salidase and beta glycosidase. This removes both the salic acid and glycose monosaccharides, and we see an increase in G0, G0F, and MAN5 glycans. And finally, when salidase, beta glycosidase, and hexosaminidase were all used at the same time, we see a shift to only MAN3, MAN3F, and MAN5. 
This can be a very useful method to determine glycan structures when MS is not an option or is an orthogonal method to complement MS analysis. Now I'm going to shift to the topic of salic acids on biotherapeutics and talk about some of the options we have for total salic acid formulation. As discussed earlier, salic acid serves a critical role in mediating the effectiveness of therapeutic glycophages. The presence or absence of salic acid at the non-terminal, at the non-reducing terminal of N or O linked glycans can impact the pharmacokinetics as well as homogeneity of the protein, which is why maximizing the amount of salic acid content during the development process of biotherapeutics is often more desired. Just to touch on what we covered earlier, the two most commonly observed forms of salic acid on biotherapeutics are our N-acetyl aromatic acid often abbreviated as NANA or UB5AC, shown here on the top as the purple diamond, and n glyconeuraminic acid, abbreviated uh, NGNA or UB5GC, shown here on the bottom as a lighter colored diamond. NANA or NANA is produced in humans, while NGNA is observed in non-human expression systems. Now let's talk about total salic acid quantitation. The Agile Advanced Bio Total Salic Acid Quantitation Kit offers a high sensitivity, high throughput approach for total salic acid quantitation. It is a 96 fold plate based assay based on a coupled enzyme reaction that begins by converting salic acid released by salidase A to hydrogen peroxide, which then reacts one to one with a fluorescent dye, generating intense fluorescence and or absorbance signal. Here's a general scheme of how things work inside an individual well. 10 microliters of glycoprotein is incubated with salidase A for 30 minutes. Released glycan, sorry, released salic acid is then converted and developed over 60 minutes to generate the one-to-one -one complex of hydrogen peroxide with the reporter dye. And then the plate is ready to be read in a standard plate reader. Since different glycoproteins can have varying amounts of glycosylation, this can also mean varying amounts of silylation. So it's a good idea to start with an amount of glycoprotein that will give a good signal. For example, MAP there has low levels of salic acid, so a larger amount of protein is necessary. While something with a lot more salic acid, such as fetuin or embryo, requires less. In this set of examples, the picomoles of protein for 10 microliters of sample is in the last column on the right. This will be useful for the subsequent mole-to-mole -mole calculations in the following examples. Here is an example of the data that can be generated using the kit. Using a set of standards alongside the actual samples, we can use the fluorescence signal from the, those standards to generate a standard curve and use the fluorescence from the samples to calculate the mole value of silic acid present in the sample. We can see here that something highly silylated, such as fetuin and or embryo, has a lot more salic acid per mole of protein compared to a monoclonal antibody like rituximab or Maptera. Also want to point out the good percent CVs that can be obtained from this workflow as well. On this slide, we see operator to operator variation for several different target glycoproteins. We can see that for most, the percent CV are well below 10% for most samples showing that reliable and consistent data can be generated with this kit, even with different users. Here we, here we looked at lot-to-lot -lot variation of the NANA salic acid standard that is supplied with the kit. Here we can see that the salic acid standard that is crucial to making sure that, that reliable data can be generated is, consistently, is consistent across three different lots of, of salic acid. And here's an example of what the standard curve can look like when following the workflow protocol. We see good linear correlation between fluorescence signal and salic acid concentration with an R squared value nearly one. And now finally, I want to finish up and discuss briefly an analytical workflow option for profiling different types of salic acid. Here we see the two different types of salic acid we discussed earlier, NANA on top with a structure to the left and NIGNA on the bottom with a well, also with a structure to the left. Both of these types of salic acids are similar in structure. The one difference is that NIGNA 
has an additional hydroxyl group, and this is enough to make Nigna potentially immunogenic to humans. In order to distinguish between these two types of sialic acids, one of the commonly used methods is to release a sialic acid from the glycan and glycoprotein, followed by labeling with a fluorescent dye such as DMB, and then LC separation and detection by fluorescence and or mass spec. On this slide, we see an example of the sialic acid reference panel. Uh, this is a mixture of different types of sialic acids labeled with DMB, separated by LC, followed by detection with uh, both fluorescence and MS. The first peak is the in the chromatograms uh, are, are the two main types of sialic acid we have been discussing. The first peak, peak A, being Nigna, and the second peak, peak B, being Nana. The other peaks in this chromatogram are other versions of sialic acid, which are acetylated. Acetylated sialic acids are often observed in nature on molecules such as EPO. Here is an example of sialic acid profiles from a few different biotherapeutics, as well as the NIST map. These annotations were made based on retention time comparison with the sialic acid reference panel, as well as MS data. For rituxan, we see mainly NU5AC with a small amount of NU5GC. Below that, Embrel has only NU5AC present. The NIST map contains only NU5GC, and Cetuxan map contains mainly NU5GC with a small amount of NU5AC. I should point out that the, the Agilent now offers direct sales of the NIST map in, in 25 microliter aliquot sizes, either as a single pack or a, or a pack of four. And on this slide, we have MS data for DMB labeled sialic acids from Embrel on the left, as well as Cetuximab on the right. For Embrel, we see the main peak being 426 M over Z, consistent with DMB labeled NU5AC. And, Cetuximab, and for Cetuximab, we see the main peak being 442, consistent with DMB labeled NU5GC. The mass difference between these two is 16 Daltons, consistent with NU5GC being hydroxylated. So in summary, we cover the benefits of the GLI-X sample prep workflow compared to older and traditional methods. We cover the benefits of instant PC in terms of its fluorescence and MS sensitivity, as well as the speed of the, of the sample preparation. We talked about the use of GLI-X with 2AB for those that want the benefits of a faster workflow but have to relate new data to, to historical data. We went through the benefits of using silylated glycan standards and libraries, as well as an application of exoglycosidases for structural analysis of N glycans. And we also covered a workflow for total silic acid quantitation available from Agilent, as well as DMB labeling for profiling of silic acids. Please feel free to reach out to us with questions and, inqu and inquiries. We are always happy to discuss collaboration opportunities, glycan sample prep workflows, glycan standards, enzymes, product demonstrations, as well as new technology ideas. And with that, I'd like to thank all of my colleagues here at Agilent and open up the floor to, uh, for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yan, for that outstanding presentation. We will now move into the live Q&A portion of the presentation. As a reminder, please submit your questions via the Q&A box to your left. Okay, let's get started. Our first question is, how much glycoprotein can I use with the Glyc-X sample prep platform for release and glycans? Um, so, the, so the manual recommendation uh, for that would be 40 micrograms, but that can go up and down depending on the protein and how much sample is available. Thank you for that. Our next question is, how much glycoprotein can I use with the sialic acid quantitation and profiling methods you described? Um, so the recommendation on that, uh, it kind of depends on the protein itself and how much sialic acid is on there. So it's really kind of protein dependent. I think in the manual, we have some recommendations around um, IgG monoclonal antibodies. But if people have specific questions, they can um, obviously reach out and uh, we can try to help them out. Thank you. Our next question is, are the Gly-X released 
and glycan prep protocols automatable? Um, so the glycan the GlyX um, protocols are currently automatable on Hamilton systems. We have an application note from a few years ago that's available. Um, they're currently in the works to be automated on the uh, AcidMap Bravo system. Um, that's in the works. Thank you. Our next question is, can you elaborate on the sample cleanup process after derivation? Um, that's a little bit of a question I'm not quite clear about. Maybe we can follow up offline about that with the um, with the questioner. Of course. We'll move into our next question. How many samples can I process with the Gly-X and Glycan kits? Um, so the kits come available in both 24 and 96 count uh, formats. So um, they're designed to be able to process um, at minimum one um, and up to 96 um, um, at a time. Thank you for that. Our next question is, what is the difference between your reagent? I lost that question. Our question is, what is the most common adduxine in MS analysis of instant PC labeled glycans? Um, I've tended to see mostly um, M plus 2H um, for most of the glycans we've looked at. For some of the larger um, glycans, it's possible to see um, M plus 3H and also different uh, addicts with um, sodium and potassium as well. They're possible. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Ian. That's just about as much time as we have Q&A today. So thank you for the audience for your outstanding questions. We hope that you found today's presentation to be informative and insightful. This presentation will be made available for on-demand viewing. So don't miss out on the other valuable presentations on today's agenda. You can visit the event presentation schedule in the auditorium. Thank you again for your particip participation. Until next time, goodbye.